The devil would tell you that something bad is coming. Jesus will tell us that something good is coming. Amen? Yeah. And uh, I am so excited about serving the Lord and being able to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter. You know, the Word of God is not bound. And um, when you study the scriptures with Apostle Paul, he pretty much was responsible for the conversion of all of Rome. Yet he was chained to a soldier. He was in prison, and yet he reached the Rome at that time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the Word of God's not bound. Amen? And today we had someone saved in our live streaming uh, in another state, in another place far away. And we thank God for that. God's saving people. Nothing uh, impossible with our Lord. He's an incredible God. And He's still saving and still delivering. Amen. Um, I want to share with you tonight something that the, the Spirit of God just uh, put in my heart. Um, I'm going to be preaching tonight on the subject, Now We Just Wait. Now We Just Wait. Paul told Thessalonica, the church of Thessalonica in the book of Thessalonians, that we are to wait patiently for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, I don't like waiting. And I sure don't like patiently waiting. If I go to the doctor's office, I don't like patiently waiting. If I go through a drive through to get my hamburger and fries, I don't like patiently waiting. But I think the devil has put in us a spirit of, of not willing to uh, wait and, and, and reach the place where um, it's performed in a timely manner. We want everything in a rush. And God, you know, you might be pushy, but God don't push. I mean, you don't push him. Now, he's pushed me several times, but you don't push him. And you might be a pushy, pushy person, but you'll never push God around. And I'm thankful for the fact that um, God has a plan, and it's all on time. It's, uh, and, you know, you, you look at it, uh, and people are prophesying and, and telling bad times are coming, bad things are coming. Well, I don't need a prophet to tell me that. I can look out my window. Amen? I don't need a prophet to tell me bad times coming. I can look at the television, the news, and, and look around. In fact, I don't even need a news report to know that bad things are all around me. But there is good things coming. Uh, there is a brighter day coming. There is a day in which all this trouble and all this stress and strife that is uh, pressuring upon the world like a straitjacket it's going to be released and people are going to be set free by the power of God. We do what we should do. By that we give our life to Jesus Christ. We receive his word. We do what he's called us to do. And then we wait. We wait patiently for God to perform and to make good things in our life. Um, you know, it takes a while for an apple tree to produce apples. It takes a while for a peach tree to produce peaches. It takes a while for a Christian to produce the fruit that God would want him to produce. It's not something that you make happen. It's something that God creates and brings to pass because it is of your divine nature by the Spirit of God to produce good things and fruitful things for the Lord. And so now that you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, if you have, then you wait, and you wait patiently on the Lord and wait patiently for the latter rain and for the harvest and for the blessings of the Lord. I want to talk to you today about how we wait and what we should do while we're waiting. And um, once again, I'm not too thrilled about waiting. Uh, you, you stop and think the devil thinks he's got us all pinned in a corner. That isn't true. The devil's a liar. Can I hear an amen out there? The devil's a liar. And uh, when he opens his mouth, he's lying. In fact, I know some folks that's related to him, obviously, because when they open their mouth, they're lying too. But anyway, I, you know, um, 
the, the devil was stripped by the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, the power of Satan, the power of sin was stripped from, from Satan when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, shed his blood, and rose again from the grave. The power of Satan was stripped, and, and, and he made a show of him openly, Jesus did, and he, what he did, he didn't do in a corner. He brought the great message of redemption through the blood of the Lamb. And so um, the only thing the devil has less uh, left you know, he thinks he's getting away with things, but he's not. Uh, the only thing de the devil has left is, well, his future is uh, decaying right now. He, he has no future. It's decaying away. And it's just a matter of time that he will be in the lake of fire. It's just a matter of time that devil will be cast out from us and be bound for a thousand years and then ultimately in the lake of fire. And we are going to celebrate, not that the devil's in the lake of fire, we're going to celebrate that we're not there with him. Amen. And we're going to celebrate the blessing of God. Amen. And so I'm going to share with you three things from the Bible that will show us um, how we should react when we wait patiently on the Lord. Now we wait. And um, when I think about that, I'm reminded of the children of Israel when they were in Egyptian bondage. And there they had been in bondage for several hundred years. They were slaves. They were mistreated. They were killed at the will of any uh, Egyptian soldier at will. Uh, their life was no more than to the Egyptians, uh, just a piece of dung. They didn't care. They pressured them. They were under bondage, and they were in Egyptian bondage. And um, they, uh, they were sent a deliverer, and that deliverer's name was Moses. And Moses came in behalf of Jehovah the Great I Am. And Moses brought the message of deliverance to the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so uh, in, in Exodus chapter 12, you have the children of Israel, and there they are in the Passover night, and the Bible says that they were in their houses during that great Passover night, and they were just waiting, waiting to walk out of Egypt free. And uh, I'm just waiting to leave this planet, and by the way, I'm not going to walk off of this planet, the only way off this planet is through the power of Jesus Christ. The only way off this place is through the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I'm in a world. I'm not of this world, but I'm in this world. And uh, Jesus Christ has liberated me and blessed me and touched my life. And those children of Israel were in that Passover night. They were in their houses. And they could not go anywhere but wait for the signal that it was time to march out with the high hand of the power of God. And so you have in uh, Exodus, the children of Israel, in bondage. They're in somewhat of a prison under the uh, strong arm and hand of Pharaoh. Then you find in the uh, book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, you find Apostle Paul and Silas in prison. They're in jail. Paul and Silas are in jail. They went to jail for preaching the gospel. If you go to jail for any other reason, that was dumb, dumb, dumb. Right? If anyone goes to jail, let it be so because they're standing for Jesus. Let it not be so because they're being a doofus. Make sure that if you go to jail, it will be in account for God's glory. But anyway, Paul and Silas was put in jail, beaten and put in jail. And they are there in jail waiting on God to send deliverance. Then there's another person that ended up in jail, and he probably should have been in jail pretty early on. His name was Apostle Peter. He was always doing something. And uh, Herod, the king, had, uh, had um, killed James, the brother of John, um, with a sword. 
And he decided because the people liked the bloodshed of James, because the people th was thrilled about him killing James, um, he, he had Peter arrested. And so he put Peter in jail, and not just in jail, he put Peter way, way, way down in the inner prison and put him next to a lot of big husky soldiers so that Peter wouldn't get out. And he too was in jail waiting for his deliverance. All three of these things, Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel in Egypt, uh, uh, Apostle Paul and Silas in, in the Philippian jail, and Peter in jail, all three of these have something in common. And that was they had to wait for God's deliverance. They all had something in common. They had to wait. And not only did they have that in common, but they had a getting out time in common. They were going to leave. They were going to be able to leave and get away from the bondage that they were in. And so God's got good plans for you. God's got great plans for you. And don't miss don't misinterpret God's power and don't misinterpret God's glory by thinking that he's dragging his feet in your life. He's not dragging his feet in your life. God has a plan. The exact moment, you're going to see great and mighty things. So I want to talk about, first of all, the children of Israel in Egypt and Egyptian bondage. I want to share that scripture with you and, and I want to point out some things that is so uh, relevant to our day. In fact, there's a plague coming, it's a plague of death, and the firstborn of every uh, male was to be put to death because uh, Pharaoh was, was not listening to God. And uh, there was gonna be, I don't know whether it was a, an angel that went through Egypt and cut heads off, or, or took a knife and stabbed them, or a sword, or whether he choked them to death, the, this, this evil force, or whether it was a disease, I don't know. I'm sure you saw the movie where it was kind of a dark cloud that would slip in under the doors and get you. That makes you sleep good at night after you watch that. But anyway, um, that's just movie stuff and it's just a bunch of baloney. But anyway, what isn't baloney is the Bible. Amen? And uh, so um, there's going to be a plague. And there had been several plagues in Egypt that um, Moses had been responsible, that God used him to bring several plagues into Egypt to get the children of Israel to leave, to get out of there. And what really set them free was the fact that the firstborn was put to death. And that firstborn points to the only begotten Son of God. Christ is our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, Christ is our Passover. Isn't that wonderful? And so the children of Israel, they're in their house and there's people screaming and they're dying all around them, but God has it covered by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So let me read that verse to you, verse 11, Exodus chapter 12. And it says, And thus shall you eat it, and that is eat the Lamb, with your loins girded. That means have your belt tight, your clothes on tight so they don't fall off, your shoes on your feet, and a staff in your hand so that you won't fall and stumble. And ye shall eat it in haste. You'd eat quick. It is the Passover. And of course we know that God had instructed them that they were to take the lamb, they were to slay it, they were to take the blood of the lamb, and they were to take hyssop and put blood on the two side posts, the upper posts of their home, and they were to go inside their house, and they were not to come out. The blood was to be applied all around the door, the blood of the lamb, and they were to go in the house, and the lamb was already prepared and ready to eat, roasted, and they were going to eat unleavened bread and eat the lamb during the night of Passover. And while they're eating that lamb, the Bible says they eat it with haste. They eat the unleavened bread, eat the lamb with haste. So let me just... Uh, point out this, this is a very important part of the message. Verse 23 of chapter 12 of Exodus says, for the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. Now let me say this right now. The plague that's threatening the United States of America, this, this virus, uh, God is not responsible for that. God's not out here killing people. He's out here delivering people. And 
And so God is not responsible for that sickness and the uh, disease. I don't know what is responsible for it. Probably not eating right in China. Maybe they were eating things they shouldn't eat. Maybe it was just a mutation. Maybe it was something done in germ warfare that got loose in a laboratory. I don't know. But I, I know this. Our people in the U.S. are pretty shook up about it. And so they're concerned. And they're afraid of the spread of this coronavirus. And afraid that there'll be hundreds and hundreds of people, perhaps thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of people die if we don't get a handle on it. And I mean, you know, God is the best handle we got. He's the best corrector we have. But anyway, um, God's not responsible. But anyway, it says, For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, that's the upper part of the house, uh, of the door post, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in into your houses to smite you. So see the picture here. They take a lamb, they slay it, it's pointing to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They take the blood, they put it on the two side posts and the upper post of their house. They go in the house and the blood protects them from the outside elements. Let me say that, say that again, the blood of the lamb protects them from the outside elements. Let me say that again. The blood of the lamb protects them from Pharaoh. The blood of the lamb protects them from death. And they go in the house and they're to stay in that house and they are to do something incredible. They're to eat. So what do we do while we wait? We eat. What a great pastime. Hello. How many, how many can qualify for that one? I'm okay with that. We go in the house, and, and while we wait, we eat. Now we wait, so while we're waiting, let us eat while we wait. What are they doing? They're in the house. They're protected by the blood of the Lamb. They have their loins girt about tightly. Their clothes are on tight. They have sandals on their feet, shoes on their feet. They're sitting at the table. They're eating unleavened bread. They're drinking or eating bitter herbs. They're eating the roasted lamb, the lamb of God, pointing to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our great Passover. And the Bible says they are to eat that lamb with haste. Meaning, while you're waiting, get as much of Jesus as you possibly can. Amen. Amen. If you find your life on pause... If you find your life in an area where you, you know, you can almost twiddle your thumbs, but it, but it hurts so bad inside, you don't want to twiddle your thumbs because you're hurting down inside. When you find yourself waiting, listen to me, it's time to get all of Jesus you can possibly get. Amen? It's time to lock yourself in the house, and it's time to eat the lamb. And the Bible says they were to eat that lamb with haste, meaning... They're to eat it as much as they can of it. They're to eat all of it. And, they, and as soon as the midnight struck and God calls them out and they begin to march out of Egypt, they have a full belly. The Bible says that when they left Egypt, there was not a feeble one among them, not a sickly one among them. When they left Egypt, if they were sick when they ate the lamb, they walked out of their house well. If there was disease in their body and they ate the lamb when they walked out of the house, they were well. If they were crippled when they ate the lamb, when they walked out of the house, they were fully healed and could walk upright. If they were old and wasted and wore out, they walked out of the house energetic like a teenager, no matter how old they were. Because that's what Jesus Christ does the little old weaklings like us. That's what Jesus Christ does for us as we turn our hearts to Jesus Christ. It's not, listen, if you find yourself on pause, if you're in an area, and by the way, I think those children of Israel were very nervous. Because they heard the screaming, they heard the crying. They knew that death was all around them, but yet they were protected in their own little house by the blood of the Lamb, 
They had put their faith in the blood of the lamb and they were protected. I think they were nervous. I guess you would call that nervous eating. And a lot of people do nervous eating. I don't think you ought to be guilty of nervous eating. Because if you weigh 100 pounds and you get guilty of nervous eating, you'll be 300 pounds in a short time. Someone says, well, that's comfort food. No, a lot of that's nervous food. And then there's some people that don't eat nothing when they're nervous. And then there's others that said, I eat everything. My mother-in-law, and God bless her, she's in heaven right now, and that's the only reason I'm saying what I'm saying right now. She's out on the front row, so I'm okay with this. But my, my mother-in-law would eat anything that didn't crawl off from her. And it was a nervous eating, and my wife knows this is true. And, and my mother-in-law, she never let it, she grew up in the, well, didn't grow up, I think she was an old woman in the Great Depression. Maybe she did a younger uh, version of mother-in-law. And she knew the Great Depression era. And so she didn't let anything waste. I mean, if you had turkey on Thanksgiving Day and the turkey still existed, two years later, you'd still have turkey on whatever day it is. They, nothing wasted. They would make a pot of beans and then turn it into chili. And as long as that chili was there, they'd eat it. And one day, her and her husband got together, going to save the chili. They ate the chili. It was like, I don't know, five, six weeks old. They ate the chili, and the rest, is, the rest of the story is over. They sit on the pot most of the next two days. They were, they were poisoned with that. But you don't want nervous eating, but yet as a Christian, it's okay to have nervous eating. As a Christian, you need to learn to get as much of Jesus as you possibly can. If you're upset, get more of Jesus. If you're discouraged, get more of Jesus. If you're facing some hard times, get more of Jesus. Amen? Because when you get all of Jesus you can get, listen to preaching. Listen to your pastor. Hello? Lay your cell phone down and listen to me. Listen to your pastor. Listen to the word of God. Read, the, read your Bible. Study the scripture. Sing gospel songs. Listen to gospel songs. Just fill yourself up with the word of God instead of all that junk food called worry. All that old junk food called strife. All that old junk food called, called heathens that don't know how to talk right around you. All that old junk food that's just going to make you sick. Get the healthy word of God in your heart. Amen. Come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding. But there's something beautiful. When the lamb was eaten, and they left their house, and they began to leave Egypt. They not only left Egypt healed, they left Egypt wealthy. So how'd they leave Egypt wealthy? They borrowed all the gold from the Egyptian ladies and their earrings, and they borrowed it all. And you say, well, they can't say they borrowed it because they never gave it back. Well, they knew they wasn't going to get it back. So it's kind of like someone walks up to me and says, Pastor, can I borrow $20? Well, I know what they're saying. They're not saying I'll pay you back next week. They're saying give me $20. Hello? There's a difference. You know who's going to pay you back and who isn't. And if they come up to you and say, uh, can I borrow $20? They, they meant they're going to get it. And God said... To the children of Israel, borrow everything. Right? Get the gold, get the, get the riches. And when they left, they left wealthy. They, didn't, they weren't stealing it. They, they received it and they walked away rich. Remember I said this morning that God wants us, God wants to bless us and enrich us spiritually, physically, mentally, and financially. I do believe that. I believe God wants us to be financially blessed, physically blessed, mentally blessed, spiritually blessed. Hello? And the children of Israel left exactly that way when they left their house. Now, there was a plague. There was death. There was, there was, there was uh, this, this coming uh, death upon Egypt. The blood of the Lamb was there. And they're getting ready to leave. 
there's just a beautiful thought just passed through my heart. Maybe we're getting ready to leave. Think about that. Just maybe we're getting ready to leave. Wouldn't that be an incredible thing? One day it will happen. I'm not a date setter, not a day setter. No man knoweth the day or the hour, not even the sun. Only the Father knows the day and the hour that the Son of Man returns to planet Earth. But could it be that we may be getting ready to leave? The children of Israel were getting ready to leave. And that's why they were told to eat in haste, put on their shoes, get ready. They're going to walk out of there. And they did walk out of there. Amen? That, so what do we learn about what do we do while we wait? Now we wait. What do we do? We eat. We get as much of Jesus as we can possibly get. That is the best point of the whole sermon. But I come to the second one. Paul and Silas are beaten and put in prison in Acts chapter 16. And Paul and Silas, they're beaten and sore and hurting and bleeding in prison. The Bible says in verse 25 of Acts chapter 16, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the found foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, Paul and Silas got th thrown in jail. And they have nothing to do now but to wait. They ain't going nowhere. They got chains and stocks on their hands and feet. They're, not, they're, they're bound in prison, so they're not going anywhere. They're bound. They're waiting. But they have something in common as the Israel and the Egyptians, Israel leaving Egypt. The children of Israel were leaving. And Paul and Silas had something in common, and that was they too were leaving. They had to wait. We know that the children of Israel, while they waited in their houses on that Passover, they ate. They got as much of Jesus as they could possibly get, as much of the lamb as they could get. And when they left, they left totally delivered. Well, what did Paul and Silas do in verse 25 of Acts 16? While they wait, they sing and pray. And they witnessed to the other Prisoners in the prison. How did they witness to them? By not being an old prune, sour, puss person. How did they witness to them? They witnessed to them by singing and letting the light of Jesus Christ shine out of them. They could have cursed. They could have accused God of their dilemma. Paul and Silas could have criticized God, could have hated the jail, could have talked evil of, of the, of, of the uh, magistrates, and, and they could have been bitter as they could be. But you know what they did? They tuned up their heart. I said they tuned up their heart. They blew the cobwebs out of their mind. And Paul and Silas let a rip and began to pray and sing. And they sung praises to God. So what do you do while you wait? You worship God. What do you do while you wait? Now we wait. What do we do? We praise and worship God. And we let our light shine. While we're waiting, we might as well do something useful. Amen? My dad would have someone come over to us. It was usually fellow workers. My dad worked for the state highway department, and, and a lot of the workers, they would come in, and my dad would, uh, uh, it was a buddy, and he'd say, they'd come in the house, and they'd be talking, and dad said, well, dad said, well, while you're waiting, let's grab a hole and go out and work in the garden. Let's dig the garden and get it all fixed up while you're waiting. And uh, they learned, I learned real quick, they didn't come to the house too often after that. But while you're waiting, you ought to do something for God. Amen? Come on now. 
Are you listening to me? You ought to do something for God. And they sang and praised God. What did they have in common with the children of Israel in Egypt? They had in common that they were getting ready to leave. And while they sang praises unto God, what, what are they to do while they wait? Sing praises unto God. Let their light shine. And when they did, God sent an earthquake. And the earthquake opened all the doors, loosed all their chains and bonds, and Paul and Silas walked out. They didn't walk out alone. They walked out with a whole bunch of prisoners redeemed. They didn't walk out alone. They walked out with the, probably the very man that beat them. They walked out with a soul saved. And I want to say today, if we're going to leave here, we, we might as well take someone with us. Hello? If we're going to leave here, we might as well take someone here with us. And so let me come to the last thought. While we wait, we sing and witness while we wait. Number three. Peter is in jail. Herod's getting ready to kill him. Let me read the scripture to you. Acts chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, Herod has arrested Peter. He's in jail. And Herod would have brought forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on his side, raised him up, saying, Arise, up quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind thy sandals. And so he did. And when he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. What, was, what did Peter have in common with the uh, Israelites in Egypt? Peter was getting ready to go somewhere. What did, what did he have in common with Paul and Silas? Getting ready to go somewhere. But Peter waits different than Paul and Silas. Peter takes his time waiting and does it different than the children of Israel. The children of Israel, Israel ate the lamb, a nervous eating, preparing to go. Paul and Silas sang and praised, sang praises unto God. What did Peter do? He goes to sleep. While he's waiting, he rests. While he waits, he rests. Now, that's good preaching, whether you like it or not. That, while he waited, he read. And what was he waiting on? Well, someone said, well, Peter was a fascinating man, and Peter knew that he was going to be busted out by an angel. Well, he didn't even believe it when he got out in the street. He said, I dreamed this. Well, Peter was a great man of God, but what was Peter waiting for? He's waiting to have his head off. That's what he was waiting for, hair to kill him. And the Bible says that when Herod would have brought him forth the next morning to put him to death like he did James, Peter was gone. And while Peter was sleeping between the soldiers, waiting, what do we do while we wait? We just rest. I said we rest while we wait. Isn't that good? We rest while we wait. While we wait. Psalm 37 verse 7, Rest in the Lord Wait patiently for him, fret not thyself. Psalm 27, verse 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. That word strengthen thy heart, Jesus will give you a strong heart. Wait, I say, unto the Lord. Wait on the Lord. And so Jesus will give you a strong heart. Well, what is a strong heart? A strong heart is someone that knows in whom they have believed. And they are persuaded that Jesus is able to keep that which they've committed unto him against that day. A strong heart is someone that knows what the Bible says and knows that God loves them and their heart will not fail them. They know that they can rest in the Lord. And Peter just rested. Let me say to everybody in this room, rest. Well, everything's in a mess. Well, everything's in a mess. I mean, everything is in a mess. And we pray, we pray for Italy. What a hor horrific thing with Italy. Yeah. All them people dying. What a horrible thing. China, the other places of the world dying because of this uh, horrific virus. Yeah. And we've had people in the U.S. die because of this virus. What a horrible, what a terrible thing. But we need to understand that God's people 
look at things different than the world. Amen. And God's people have a strong heart. And we know that none of us is going to be snuffed or squashed out of here without God's ultimate permission. No one's going to die until God says it's time to come home. We are indestructible as children of God. When it's time to go home, it'll be time to go home. You say, what do you mean if we're indestructible? You mean we can run out on I-44 in front of a tractor trailer wreck? No. That doesn't mean you're indestructible. It means you're just literally stupid. Out of your mind. Hello. And God will pick up all the pieces. Excuse me. The undertaker will pick up all the pieces. And God will gather all the pieces of your stupidity. If you're a Christian, he'll take you home. And if you're not a Christian, you ain't got no home up there. Hello. I'm glad I got a home up there, not a home down there. See, preacher, you afraid to say it? Say it, preacher. You afraid to say it? Say it, preacher. All right, I'll say it. Hell. H-E double toothpicks. Hell. Now, it may surprise you, but Jesus is the one that preached on hell more than anybody else. Did you know Paul didn't even preach on hell? Apostle Paul talked about, I wish my, I was a curse than my, uh, for the sake of my brethren. But he didn't mention hell. He said, I wish to be cursed for my brethren if they could be saved. Paul said, you could be a castaway. And, and lose your way. And he talked about better to marry than to burn. Well, that's not hell. That's not the lake of fire. What that man is is better to marry than to run around in lust. The burning's not burning. The burning's lusting. And so Paul didn't preach hell. He believed in hell, and he hinted around about it. But Jesus is the one that said that you'll be cast into the fire where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched in Mark chapter 9. You said, preacher, you could have preached all night and not said that. No, you're wrong. I could have preached all night. Hello? And some of you may be thinking right now, you are. Hey, don't give me a hard time. You're at home watching this on social media, on YouTube or Facebook. Don't give me a hard time. You're the one sitting there with a Dr. Pepper and some Frito chips eating them while I'm trying to preach. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Hey Amen. I don't know what you're eating. Maybe you're eating pretzels. And maybe you're sitting there drinking your Dr. Pepper or drinking your lemonade or drinking that coffee. And you're looking at it and saying, well, Brother James, preach it. And yeah, you can say that. You're the one that's got a, a lap full of Frito Lays and bean dip. I'm up here starving, and I've been talking about eating while I wait. And you're, you're, never mind. I don't even know who you are, but I'm sick of you. Now, don't put no nasty stuff on, on, the, on my Facebook, because I'll send it to Carissa. She's my PR lady. But anyway, we're glad that you came. We're glad that you tuned in. And... Uh, I want to encourage everybody. Josh, come and bring a song, would you, buddy? And he's going to bring a song, and we're going to give an invitation to maybe someone that needs to come to an altar tonight in this gathering. Don't have a large gathering tonight, but we've got those that come to help us in the uh, uh, streaming, the live streaming broadcast, and we appreciate you helping us with that, and we appreciate our helpers with that, uh, helping us with the live streaming. And so maybe some of you that are here helping us, maybe you could use some help from the Lord. And um, if you're watching us on uh, live streaming on your computer, your phone or whatever, put down your free dose and your bean dip and, and talk to the Lord. Let God touch your life. Those, those chips will be there when you're done. They're not going anywhere. And uh, you can enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Hello. Stand with me. We're going to give an invite. And maybe you're over there watching us on Facebook or live streaming. This would be a good time for you to clear off a spot at your home. Maybe with your wife or maybe with your children or maybe 
you just maybe you're alone this would be a good time for you to just clear off a spot and thank God for his love and and use this as a time of waiting rest while you're waiting get all get all of Jesus you can get while you're waiting Sing and let your light shine while you're waiting. Because ultimately, we're going someplace. And could it be that we're about to leave? That's exciting. But while we wait, let's do it right. Josh, go ahead. He's all I need. He's all I need. He's all I need. Can you sing that with Josh? Jesus is all I need. He's all he I is need. all I need. He's all I need. Yes, he is. Jesus, Jesus is, all is all I need. I need. And while we wait, Jesus. now we just wait. Jesus. America's at that place all now. I we just wait. We're at that place. Some people don't have jobs. Some people don't have any money. Some people are, they can't go anywhere. And they're fearful and afraid of getting sick. Now, we wait. We wait. And we wait on God. Isaiah 40 verse 31, that last verse of Isaiah 40, says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings of the eagle. They shall run and be not weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Oh yeah, let's wait on the Lord. And as we wait on the Lord, He will strengthen our heart. He will give us a strong heart. He's all I need. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What an awesome God. Amen. I say to those that are here helping me with the live streaming, I want to say to those that's watching us on Facebook live streaming, while you wait, while you wait, just get all of Jesus you can get. Get as much as a lamb as you can get. While you wait, let your light shine. Praise God and sing unto the Lord. And while you wait, just rest. Rest. Don't be afraid. Don't be weary. Let Jesus strengthen your heart. Let Jesus give you a strong heart. Amen. Amen.